The family, as it were, is a natural preparatio evangelica written into our heart nature. This is why the devil is so intent on destroying the family. If the family is destroyed, we lose our God-given anthropologi anthropological foundations and so find it more difficult to welcome the saving good news of Jesus Christ, save giving fruitful love. St. John Paul II explained, if it is true that the family is a place where more than anywhere else human beings can flourish and truly be themselves, it is also a place where human beings can be humanly and spiritually wounded. The rupture of the foundational relationship of someone's life through separation, divorce, or distorted imposition of the family, such as cohabitation or same-sex unions, is a deep wound that closes the heart to self-giving love into death and even leads to cynicism and despair. These situations cause damage to the little children through inflicting upon them a deep existential doubt about love. They are a scandal, a stumbling block that prevents the, the most venerable from believing in, the, in such love and a crushing burden that can prevent them from opening to the healing power of the gospel. Advanced societies, including, I regret, this nation, have done and continue to do everything possible to legalize such situations. But this can never be a truthful solution. It is like putting bandages on the inflicted wound. It will continue to poison the body until antibiotics are taken. Sadly, the advent of artificial reproductive technologies, surrogacy, so-called homosexual marriage, and other evils of gender ideology will inflict even more wounds in the midst of generation we live with. This is why it is so important to fight to protect the family, the first cell of the life of the church and every society. From the beginning, when I, I went for catechism, my parents was very devoted to Our Lady. And uh, I think I learned from them what is to love Our Lady and to be devoted to her. And during my seminary formation, I continued to be very fond to Our Lady. And I can say that she is very near to me, still now. Your Eminence, even in your Episcopal coat of arms, you have uh, the image of Our Lady, that is, you have a, an M, That's which right. I suppose is referring to a Mary. And then on the lower left, you have a figure uh, you have an image of two figures in a boat. Yes. Um, can you just briefly explain what is your Episcopal coat of arms and why did you choose this image? Yes, you're right that M means Mary and uh, uh, the boat with two figures represent uh, Mary and myself inside the boat. And Mary is conducting the boat to Jesus 
if you notice uh, on the top, there is a cross yes. that is Christ. So uh, all my life, all my ministry, and my diocese was conducted by the Virgin Mary. That is the significance of my uh, motto. I mean that uh, what I am, what I'm doing, must be conducted by Our Lady. God brings good from evil. This is how God has worked from the beginning of creation. God is not overcome by evil. He overcomes evil with good. Today, the church must fight against prevailing trends with courage and hope. And do not and not be afraid to raise her voice to denounce the hypocrites, the manipulators, and the false prophet. For two thousand years, the church has faced many contrary winds, but at the end of the most difficult journey, the victory was always won. Who influenced you to choose this vocation? Well, I was very impressed by the generosity of the missionaries. Okay. He came to my village, very poor village. He lived with the, with the population yeah. very simply. And uh, uh, I went to the school with them. He cured people. Uh, so uh, this generosity touched me very much. So I said, it could be uh, good if I can imitate this kind of service for the church yeah. and for, the, for God. So one day one, uh, one of them said, do you want to go to seminary? Well, I said, what is seminary? Yes, yes. He said, it is a, a school, a special school, when people can uh, progressively learn how to serve the Lord. Yes. So I said, yes. The example of the missionary was, uh, for me, very inspiring. So you see Jesus Christ in that missionary. That's so right. that is very interesting. His example, his way of life yeah. inspired you. Yeah. So you must really be chosen for a reason. Every morning, uh, I went to the church. Okay. And every, every night, all the children were gathered around a big cross ah, okay. in our village. Yes. And the, the missionary was teaching us who is God, the gospel the history of the church. Yeah. So I learned from them that uh, it is very good to be uh, at service of, of, of the Lord. Mm. So that's why I, uh, I asked my mother and my, my, my father if it is possible that I can go to the seminary. He was very hesitant in the beginning. Yeah. And then said, well, if this is the will of God, please go in. So I went to the seminary like that. And do you have brothers and sisters? I have no brothers. So you're the only one? I am the only child. Wow. So the magnanimity, magnanimity of your parents to let you go, that yes. was really something, yes. you know? They are very Catholic. Ah, yeah. okay. So every, they were already in, uh, influenced yes, by yes. your faith. And every day they went for Mass. So uh, I have been sustained by my father and my mother through prayer and through affection, you know. Cardinal Robert Sarah is again calling for greater respect for the Blessed Sacrament. In the preface of a new book on the subject, he asked rhetorically, why do we insist on communicating standing in the hand? Why this attitude of lack of submission to the signs of God? He goes on, the most insidious diabolical attack consists in trying to extinguish faith in the Eucharist, sowing errors and favoring an unsuitable manner of receiving it. Truly, the war between Michael and his angels on one side and Lucifer on the other continues in the heart of the faithful. Satan's target is the sacrifice of the Mass and the real presence of Jesus in the consecrated host, he said. To do this, we must learn to separate ourselves from destruction, to cultivate silence, 
and the love of silence in our hearts. We must develop virtue and bring order in our internal lives. We must come to know ourselves and the dignity and the vocation with which we have been blessed. Finally, we must learn to govern ourselves and our world together in friendship with one another, make, making proper use of the world which our Lord has entrusted to us. When he prophetically announced the Second Vatican Council in the Apostolic Constitution, Humani Salutis, St. John XXIII remarked that the human community was in turmoil as it sought to establish a new world order where humanity relies entirely on technical and scientific solution instead of God. Today we are witnessing the next stage and the consummation of the efforts to build a utopian paradise on earth without God. It is a stage of denying sin and the fall altogether. But the death of God results in the burial of good, beauty, love, and truth. Good becomes e e evil, beauty is ugly, love becomes the satisfaction of se sexual primal instincts, and truth are all relative. So all manner of immorality is not only accepted and tolerated today in advanced societies, but even promoted as a social good. The result is hostility to Christians and increasingly religious persecution. Thank you.